So good morning. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, about three to four months ago, I was talking to a very large bank. And we normally do these workshops and exercises with them to uh, really understand the kind of pains they're going through. And in this room is myself uh, and their VP of engineering, a director of engineering, DevOps folks, uh, product folks, uh, individual contributors. And I asked them a, a question that they really just couldn't answer. And to be fair, it wasn't like they didn't have an answer, but you could tell because they were all arguing about the answer that they didn't really know what the answer was. And it was a pretty simple question, which is, what does your CI CD process look like? And the reality is, is that these processes have so many things that go into it that not a single person really has the answer. The second part of that is that as we defined the process a year ago, it looks very different to today because we're always iterating, we're always improving. And then where does that get codified? In our heads. And so as people leave the company and new people enter, answering the question of how this piece of software gets into production is actually rather impossible without having to have meetings, uh, going to a Wikipedia, but that, a wiki page, but that won't have the full answer. So we're in this room, and they don't have the answer. Uh, but the workshop and the exercise is to try to get the answer. And of course, we start with something simple like this, which is how does stuff get into production? Oh, well, it goes to this thing called dev, and it progresses till it gets into production. But the reality is that it includes people, like developers, like QA, who's running the integration tests. It also involves external systems, like Git, is that what kicked off the pipeline? So as we're starting to dig in and understand a little bit more about what their process actually looks like, uh, the, the pipeline and the diagram gets richer and more complex. But it doesn't stop here. Uh, we actually have development environments. We run integration, actually, in the, in the development environment. Um, as we go to stage, we run the integration tests again. Turns out that we uncovered that there's PM approval. Now, the way that they were managing this uh, process here, the PM, QA, DevOps approval, the way that they were managing that was through spreadsheets, through JIRA, and a bunch of meetings. And so, uh, you know, that's software delivery by, by spreadsheets, and I think we can do better than that. Uh, after the approval happens, they went to go update uh, JIRA, and then, they would wait for Tuesday to happen. And when you ask them why Tuesday, well, that's just when we do deployments. And so I, probably a lot of us in this room have an arbitrary day when we do deployments. It's, I'm not sure what Tuesday is better than Wednesday or Thursday. They just happen to choose that, that date. And probably the person who chose that date no longer works at that company, has moved on. So nobody there knows why, but they have it there anyways. So what starts off as what we all think as a simple deployment script to a particular environment is actually more like this. Talk to your manager, talk to that other product person, get the, the approval of product, do a security scan, and then update JIRA. It is a amalgamation of all of these scripts and a lot more that software delivery is. And so this is the exercise. So this is us actually running through it. And I use little sticky notes with them uh, because they don't really know their own process. Somebody will put up a sticky note and then the other person will go ahead and move it to say that this isn't actually how it happens. It allows us to be fluid. We erase the lines and we draw them to new, uh, new cards. And we do this process together until we have a really full pipeline that tells us, tells us the full story about how software gets from uh, a developer's laptop all the way into production. Here's a couple more pictures. It turns out that, it, <laughs> I laugh a little bit because when they, they told me they just deployed into Amazon, uh, as we dug in, they actually deployed to GCP as well and HIPAA, but I thought it was odd because they didn't tell me up front that that was the case. It, it took a lot of probing to really get into understanding what happened. They also deployed a Kubernetes as well. That was like a vague mention at the beginning of the conversation. And so we end up with this, this diagram. So here is what it looks like in the end. 
even still, this is a little bit abstract. If you notice here, uh, we've grouped AWS, GCP, and HIPAA environments all into a single box, uh, but that isn't actually how it happens. This goes through, in each, 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 in each cloud, we actually deploy to multiple regions in a phase deployment doing canary rollout. So it's actually a lot more complex than what you see on the screen. And that's the truth. That's the complexity of the world that we live in when it comes to software delivery. And this is the, the, the thing that Spinnaker goes to solve is not deployments, it's delivery. Delivery begins when somebody starts coding on something and wants to see it in an environment and never, it doesn't end when it gets into production because after it gets into production, we still have to monitor those things and those have to roll back into the way that we do deployments, the way that we verify that our deployment was okay and involves security, like Tracy was saying earlier, that, that was, uh, and Chrissy was saying earlier. Those are really, really important aspects to our deployments um, and, we, and it needs to be integrated into what we call software delivery today. So a little bit more about uh, Spinnaker. We have an extremely active community. We have over 400 com uh, contributors, mostly from the cloud providers themselves, like Google, like Amazon, uh, Microsoft. We have over 100 commits a day, and we are growing our community year over year. It's used across hundreds of enterprises. These are just some of the, the few companies that are using it in production today. I actually did a keynote at the Spinnaker Summit this weekend, and on stage we also had Salesforce, Pinterest, Airbnb, who are great additions to the community who are using Spinnaker at massive scale in the cloud. So we're not here to just talk about Spinnaker or just software delivery. I'm here to tell you about how Jenkins and Spinnaker is something really awesome. And if you look at how Spinnaker was born, it was born at Netflix, and they realized they had one of the most massive Jenkins uh, clusters in the world. And all of their software delivery went through there, and they didn't want to rip it out. They wanted to add to what Jenkins was already doing. And so Spinnaker was born with first-class integration to Jenkins to add, and, uh, add value on top of what Jenkins is already doing. But we want to go through some terminology first because our terminology is slightly different. Spinnaker is a application-centric platform, not an infrastructure-centric platform. If you go into the AWS console or you're looking at a, a Kubernetes console, it tells you all of the nodes or the pods that are running. But if you're an application developer, you really only care about your application. Everything else just doesn't really matter to you. And so everything in Spinnaker starts with the application. And we refer to this as a, an atomic deployable unit it's typically a microservice, again, because this was born at Netflix. Everything at Netflix is microservices oriented. A pipeline is a defined workflow of a trigger, something that automate, automatically uh, sets off the pipeline or executes the pipeline, and multiple stages that we put together. The trigger is an automated way to kick off the pipeline. For example, a git commit, or somebody pushing something to an S3 bucket, or somebody pushing something to JFrog, or a container to do uh, Docker registry. And stages, now stages are different for us than they are in the world of Jenkins or maybe other stages you might be familiar with. These are actually predefined actions that are used in the pipeline to create our, our, our workflow. You don't write code for these stages, they're all predefined, you just uh, express and configure your, uh, the inputs into that stage. And this is the, the powerful thing about, uh, about Spinnaker is that it hides or abstracts the complexity from you so you can just focus and worry, on, uh, and, and worry about the things that you need to get done. So this is what it looks like together in the upper left-hand corner. I would do a live demo, but I'm not that brave. So uh, these are little animated GIFs. In the upper left-hand corner, you have your application name. Uh, these are our software delivery pipelines. Uh, that middle tab, the infrastructure tab, will show you what's actually deployed into production and tasks show you everything that's been executed through the UI or otherwise. So you have this rich UI that tells you everything you need to know about your application so that you can actually start writing a pipeline that encompasses from, from your developer's laptop to production. So how do we configure a Jenkins master? It's pretty simple. We have a tool called Halyard, which we call HAL for short. 
If a master already exists, you just configure it by giving it your, uh, the, the Jenkins name, the URL, the username and password to connect up to the API. And then we redeploy Spinnaker and Spinnaker will start uh, polling Jenkins and asking for the jobs that are available, what jobs have been executed and completed. And now we can actually start integrating our pipelines with Jenkins. So let's get into some pipeline configuration. So when we first set up our pipeline, we first just configure the pipeline, no stages just yet. We want to trigger off of something typically. What I'm doing here is I'm just scrolling down through the available jobs in Jenkins so that I can listen to those jobs and when those jobs execute or complete, we will kick off this pipeline. A little bit more here, there's a property file input that property file input a lot, uh, uh, gives us the ability to get outputs from the Jenkins job through a key value file. That key value file will contain things like a git hash or the artifact name, or maybe we're going to dev or stage or production, whatever it is that you want to tell Spinnaker uh, through some sort of variables, you can do so in that file. We also support a lot of other triggers like, uh, like Git and Docker and S3 and GCS, um, PubSub. So we integrate with a lot of different sources to be able to kick off this pipeline. So let's get into stages, one of the most powerful aspects of Spinnaker. So here we're defining a Jenkins stage. This allows us to actually kick off a job on Jenkins. So at the very beginning, Jenkins was kicking a pipeline off. Now we're using Spinnaker to integrate back into Jenkins and to kick off a job. Again, we define the job that we want to kick off. In this case, we are gonna kick off Chef. And we're able to pass in attributes into, uh, or as inputs back into this. And what's great about this is, and I've seen this a lot of uh, companies, is that typically these things are manually done. There's a person's job to go kick off a pipeline with a particular tag that comes from, from JIRA or comes from some other data source. And we're now able to integrate all of these things and these jobs together seamlessly. So one of the things about software delivery and CD is that there's a lot of human processes involved with it. Humans are always involved in these processes and it's very hard to remove them as much as we want to, as much as it's my goal at Armory and our goal as part of the CD F to automate everything and to make sure that we can get everything into production, it's gonna take time. And so we have this stage called the manual judgment stage. And this allows us to stitch together stages together and having a human uh, input in the way. So if you can recall that first slide where I had the, PA, uh, the PM approval, the QA approval, and the uh, DevOps approval, we can actually set up these approvals in Spinnaker and that way you can stitch these jobs together. It gets you out of uh, spreadsheets. It gets you out of doing these ad hoc meetings just to make sure that someone's gonna say yes or no. Uh, and I think that's a great thing because I think we can all agree that meetings aren't the best thing in the world. We can also set up different inputs for the judgment to say, I'm too scared to deploy, let's do it. Whatever it is you need, the kind of feedback you need from the users, we can have that. The other thing that we can add on top of the value that Jenkins provides if it's already doing a lot of the work for you are these things called deployment windows. So uh, nobody likes to deploy at 5 p.m. on Friday because I know for one, I love hanging out on the weekend with my kids. I don't want people deploying on a Friday and it ruining my whole weekend. So in Spinnaker, you can have these deployment windows that says nobody deploy on Fridays uh, after 12 or two, or whatever time you want. It will sit there and wait until the next deployment window is open. So that way, you can actually start the deployment process and get to the very point that you needed to stop, and the moment that window opens again, maybe it's Monday morning at 10, it continues going without human intervention. Now, this is a, this, there's a very important thing here that um, we believe in. We believe in guardrails, not gates. This is something that you'll hear Andy Glover, the director of Netflix, who uh, uh, started uh, Spinnaker there, says a lot. And this is a guardrail. This is gonna tell you to slow down and stop because it's 3 p.m. on a Friday, don't deploy, people love their weekends. But if you really need to deploy, it's not gonna stop you. You can still override that and continue deploying into production in case there's an emergency. We also have this concept of auto verifications. Now you'll see in the UI that it's called canarying. Uh, and, and really what we're doing here, canarying, if you think about canarying, it's actually two parts. Everyone kind of puts them together, but it's two parts. One is the orchestration part. 
How do we deal with traffic management? How do we roll out our, our software? The second part, though, is the analysis part. Typically, we do that manually. We go to these Datadog dashboards or metrics dashboards, and we go look at this chart, and we go, what did it look like yesterday? And does it 45% CPU look right? Yeah, it kind of looks OK. Let's keep moving forward. Let's go to 10 servers, right? So let's, just, let's put the orchestration part to the side. But if you just take the analysis part, that part really shouldn't be done by humans. Uh, computers are pretty good with numbers. So let's let the computers do that, their job. And so what we do, we built a system. This is uh, the third generation system. It was built by uh, mostly Google and Netflix on uh, our verification engine. And all it does is it takes two time series sets of data and compares them against each other uh, using an algorithm called the Man whitney u algorithm. And this test tells us whether these two numbers are the same or different. You can literally throw stock ticker symbols at it. Anything that is time series based, we will accept. So we can take data from like memory, CPU, revenue, transactions per second, queue length size, and we can compare those things and we'll automatically tell you whether this is a good deployment or not. Uh, I should say whether this deployment looked like yesterday's deployment or not. And if yesterday's deployment was a good one, then we should continue moving forward. And so we can, this is a highly configurable thing. It gets us humans doing things that we're not really good at, like looking at dashboards and comparing numbers. We can get back to coding, enjoying our day, being productive for our companies. So here, uh, I'm just uh, uh, configuring this Canary engine, or the analysis engine. Uh, I'm waiting it a little bit. I'm gonna say this is a, a CPU-bound application. Um, and then giving it the input. So you can see here I'm looking at all of these metrics. Now the Netflix API is actually deployed using this very same system, and they look at hundreds of metrics. So you can throw as many metrics as you want at this. It will do the analysis for you and come up with a judgment. Again, the whole idea is adding value on top of the, the deployment that Jenkins is already doing for you. Here we're configuring the stage. There we just configured the, the actual profile. And the reason we, we separated these two things is because if you look at API systems, they all roughly look and, and behave the same. We want to roughly look at the same level of metrics. So we wanted to take out the, the profile and be able to use that profile again. Then we actually come back in here and we actually configure a stage with it. Um, the baseline offset here is where I'm saying, hey, look back 100 minutes prior. But you can look back 24 hours prior, 48 hours prior, so you can compare today with what happened with yesterday. So it's up to you to configure it however you want. Uh, it's uh, extremely configurable. The lifetime there is really important. And the reason why the lifetime there is really important is because ultimately, in order to do data analysis, we need data. And if you don't have enough data, then it will, it might be a little bit off. So if you need more time to collect the data and collect confidence in what you're deploying, um, set that for a longer time. You know, and, and Netflix even still has problems with this, and you can imagine their scale. Uh, they set things for a longer period of time, but it gets enough data to give it confidence. So here's our final pipeline. Man, I'm just moving too fast. All right, so there's a manual judgment. We are gonna update our chef server, call out to um, Jenkins, then we call out to Jenkins again to actually do the deployment. And then after the deployment is done, we will do an automated verification. All of this using Jenkins and Spinnaker together so you're adding value. So once we execute it, I executed it manually there. I just pushed the button. It asked me for the, uh, the artifact or the job number from Jenkins that I want to run. It starts kicking off the pipeline. You see it running. It stopped there at that manual judgment. I went ahead and, uh, and approved it. So there I'm starting it again, picking build number 36, which is the last one, telling me which is the trigger. The manual judgment comes up. I select yes, because I do want it to continue going. And it continues. I could have said no, and the pipeline would have stopped. Right? Again, getting, getting out of uh, CD by spreadsheets. Here, because it's not uh, Tuesday, so I'm modeling out that pipeline from the very beginning, uh, it's going to stop. right? Uh, as I mentioned, we believe in guardrails and not gates, so I'm going to continue moving forward. I'm going to say skip. So I am going to uh, push this forward, but it does stop me. It does uh, try to advise me on what I should be doing. And then it's going to continue moving forward. 
Once it gets into the Jenkins stage, we have a lot of information back from Jenkins on what Jenkins is doing, the job that it's running, how it's running, how it's progressing, it gives us a link back to Jenkins so we can go see the job, right? There's a task, waiting for the job to start, waiting for uh, Jenkins to find a proper runner. And if we, oh, and if we have uh, JUnit uh, output uh, from tests, we actually pull that back into Spinnaker as well and you can see uh, the number of tests failed or passed. And this is the last one, the verification stage, which I think is the, uh, the most valuable thing here in this, in this pipeline, is that we're actually running a live service and we're able to grab data from whatever data uh, store or metrics provider you have, whether it's Datadog, New Relic, Prometheus, uh, we integrate with many different sources. And you can see it doing the analysis, and it's doing the analysis in, I believe, five-minute uh, intervals, and you can go into here and see exactly how it's doing its analysis. It gives you a little bit of feedback of what, that, what the numbers look like. So if anything were to fail, and this is really important, if anything were to fail, you were able to go back in there and uh, dig into the pipelines and understand exactly what's going on. And so very early on, we started using machine learning for, for this type of analysis, and we realized that it was a really bad idea uh, because two reasons. One, fitting a model for this type of data is really, really hard. It's actually not a normal distribution. It's, 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 it's very um, power law distribution for a lot of the data that we use in system level metrics. Uh, and then it's different for, let's say, traffic. Uh, and so the other reason why it's really bad is because if you have a model and something breaks in it, it'll definitely tell you that something broke, but you figuring out as a developer what broke is practically impossible. And so trying to debug this was hard. So sometimes simpler is better, and in this case it is, because it allows us to go in and understand like, oh, the CPU went up, allows us to start our investigation as to why. Once everything is in production, uh, let's, after everything's deployed, here's our application-centric infrastructure view. Again, I don't care about the other 100 applications that are running in my Kubernetes cluster. I care about mine that I call commits. I can see the nodes and pods that are running here. On the right-hand side, I can actually pull up the logs from those pods so I don't have to do kube control to switch between accounts uh, or uh, namespaces. It easily comes up. I can see what's healthy or unhealthy. If these pods weren't coming up, it would tell me exactly why they didn't come up. Uh, so we're able to actually scale them up and scale them down easily. So there's a lot of activity that we can do in this application-centric point of view that, we that would be a lot harder to do through the CLI. So what did we do in the last 20 minutes? So we automated that manual handoff between uh, human beings that came out of spreadsheets and meetings. We automated the deployment verification so that we don't have to sit behind uh, metrics dashboards and just kind of guess at what is good and what is bad. We added deployment windows for safety so that we know not to deploy on Friday at 3 p.m. and we can all enjoy our weekends. We visualized the infrastructure inside of whether it's Kubernetes or AWS or uh, GCP. We can actually visualize our infrastructure across multiple accounts, across multiple regions for our application. As developers, we only care about our applications, not the world of the infrastructure. And this is what makes Jenkins and Spinnaker so awesome. So thank you. If you want to get started, go to spinnaker.io. I appreciate the time.